everyone and welcome back. I hope you are all ready for the grand culmination of these weeks and weeks of hard work to get this ensemble put together. If you have not been following along, I have been gradually working my way through all of the accessories and the actual construction of a garment that is pulled from the collection of Abby Cox. And it is a gorgeous 1914 ensemble, which is incredibly dark and spooky and vampy. It has a dramatic high collar and tone on tone embroidery. The entire thing is made out of a very drapey silk jacquard. And I have needed this in my life since I saw it back in October. So we are finally reaching the point today where I get to show you the entire thing all put together and I am so incredibly excited. Now this particular garment is very evocative of the 1914 and very beginning of 1915 period and it's honestly sort of unusual that we are able to take something and date it so specifically to really one year but the 19 teens are a really weird decade when it comes to fashion. They go through massive transitions over those 10 years. You start off with styles that are very straight and simple, very column-like. There are overlays and beautiful fabrics being used, but they're very often somewhat symmetrical and fairly almost geometric in their overall appearance. As you move into the 19-teens a little bit further, by the time we reach 1913, they start to get a little weird. They start looking at more asymmetrical styles and start making entire garments out of just layers and drapes and gathered pieces. They get very unpredictable in this year and a lot of crazy ideas seem to come forward and this continues into 1914 where they take a lot of the asymmetry and silhouettes of the 1913 point and over exaggerate it and add more aggressive elements. One of the very specific things to 1914 is this really aggressive high pointy collar that comes in and it is just everywhere. So many things have this high collar. You add this in with not only asymmetrically draped skirts that seem to have a very unusual shape where they actually get fuller at the knee area and then tuck back in, where the jackets also have a high front and a very low back, usually an added skirt to the jacket or the bodice. They really like to play with dramatic levels in terms of where your horizontal or even vertical lines are. So it's just all over the place, but they still balance their garments very well. They're not absolute insanity. So we move from those styles into 1915 and that's where things start to dramatically shift again. Now we've gone from very straight styles to very drapey styles with lots of asymmetry and we start to move back towards symmetrical styles but with a very dramatic large skirt. The skirt gains more and more fullness, the waist becomes very accentuated. These skirts not only start to get very large moving into the latter half of the 19 teens but they start to shorten as well. So by the time you reach the 1918 point you might recognize this more as a 1950s skirt than a 19-teens skirt. And this is what starts to transition us into the 1920s, because as we reach 1919, the skirts deflate, go back down, but the hemline stays up around the mid-calf. So that's really the start of the short skirt, but all of this occurs in 10 years, going from straight and symmetrical to asymmetrical and drapey to very full skirts and high hemlines and back down to straight styles again. And it's just such a whirlwind of a decade. And I love it so much for that reason, because there's something for everybody in there. And I really do want to spend more time there. But we're starting with this 1914 period where we have all of this asymmetry and draping and the high collars and the very dramatic styles, because this garment is nothing if not dramatic. And I can say that both inside and out. Not only does it have that look when you're wearing it, but this thing is full of secret mysteries and magical things and I just did not expect what I found inside. Because we're looking at an era that is incredibly drapey and lightweight and loose fitting in so many ways, but they still haven't moved out of the full structured garments of earlier decades. They're still trying to combine the two. And honestly, it works 
so well because these garments look very loose and drapey, but they hold their shape and they hold their form and they don't distort. It's all very, very secure and very, very carefully tailored, though it doesn't look like it at all. And that was my entire journey through this garment, which I thought I was going to make very quickly, by the way, because I've done this era before. This just basically looks like a slightly overdone blouse. The skirt's a little weird, but once I get a pattern off of that, I can manage that totally easy, right? Right. Huh. Wrong. <laughs> I have learned so much from this bodice and this skirt. I can't even express the amount of knowledge I have gained from this garment and remaking it, but Every single step of the way, I went to look at what I needed to do next and discovered layers that I didn't realize that were there, stitching that I thought was functional. Turns out, no, almost all of the machine stitching on this thing is just decorative top stitching along the edges. It's nearly entirely put together by hand. Which just goes against most of what we tend to think of as that era of mass production coming in and things being made quickly and efficiently and this garment has the most amazing secrets to tell us not only in just the construction techniques but in the way that it moves and is worn and also interestingly enough in the way that it was patterned because there is a lot buried in this piece. More than I could have ever expected for something so lightweight and loose and fancy free, but in reality has just as much going on inside of it as a tailored jacket of the same era. So as always, we have to start somewhere. And I decided not surprisingly to start with the embroidery. It was something that I knew was going to take me a little bit of a longer period of time. It was something that I knew I needed to have accomplished before I really got into construction. I didn't want to stop midway through the bodice and have to do the embroidery at that point. So I wanted to begin there. So I found some really nice stiff silk satin and backed it with muslin, just like the original has, and used a very heavy spun silk thread for the actual embroidery. Remember, this is tone on tone, black on black, so it really relies on the texture to make the embroidery pop. So with that, I dove into this project and really appreciated that my sponsor for this week helped keep my sanity throughout the entire process of embroidery. While it may seem that based on the few seconds of stitching that you see me repeatedly do, that I work in an entirely silent environment with absolutely no interruptions or entertainment whatsoever, in reality, it's much more often just like this. We've been on tentacles, spun a yarn. With me sitting and listening to an audiobook, it's a way to keep entertained while still working efficiently because my hands and my eyes are still focused on my work. And it's something that I rely on constantly with audible.com to make sure that I don't get bored while I work on incredibly monotonous, repetitive things, just like embroidery. For this particular project, I chose to listen to The Golden Thread by Cassia St. Clair. And it's all about how textiles impacted history, not only in modern day, but all the way back to prehistoric periods. It is a wonderful journey through the history of textiles in ways that I hadn't necessarily looked at them before. And honestly, there's no better way to take in these stories than by sitting and embroidering or sewing. It really is just the perfect way to learn all about the history of textiles while getting to actually experience them firsthand. So I highly recommend hopping on over to audible.com slash Nicole R or text Nicole R to 500 500 and try out their 30 day free trial. There are so many options to choose from and every month you get a new credit so that you can go and find something interesting, educational, or just plain exciting to listen to. So once again, that's audible.com slash Nicole R or text Nicole R to 500 500 and you can stay just as entertained through your monotonous repetitive stitching as I do. The embroidery for the original is done with a very heavy silk thread and it's a rather chunky embroidery done on top of a stiff silk satin which is backed with just a plain muslin. It's a very efficient and effective way to get embroidery done very quickly and since it does seem that this embroidery was custom fit to this particular garment, that it likely was done at the same time that the garment was constructed and had to be done pretty quickly. 
So I just start off by actually basting the pieces of silk satin to the piece of muslin. The muslin itself is what will actually get stitched to the embroidery frame, so that way I don't have to worry about fraying out or damaging the silk satin. In order to get the design onto the silk, which is black, therefore I can't use a pen or a pencil, I actually use a process called pouncing, where I create the design on paper and then poke a bunch of holes where the key points are and just use powdered chalk in a little bag to let it sift through those holes to show me sort of a blueprint for the actual embroidery design. I'll then actually clean up all of those spaces, starting with the objects that are a little bit more clear, otherwise it just becomes a constellation filled night sky. And from there I'll stitch things into my embroidery frame and start working. Like I said, it's a very simple embroidery, most of it is done with a satin stitch, though a few pieces are done with couching, meaning that I took a very thick chunk of actually four threads at one time and just simply stitched and tacked them down with another thread. This fills the space really quickly, but doesn't take terribly long, thankfully. I then got to work on the skirt. This was something that seemed fairly simple in its general construction, but it's cut a lot of fiddly bits. More so than anything, it's the fact that it's a very unusual shape and cut. While the lining is fairly simple, the two over layers are draped and pleated and are really, really weird shapes, and very large shapes at that. So I had to cut them out on the floor, even though I have a very large cutting table. There's just no other way to do it, with the fact that they use a full width of the fabric and are such complicated shapes. For the fabric that I'm working with, I chose to go with a similar silk to card. Mine's a little bit lighter weight than the original, just because it's hard to find the type that was historically used, but still has a fairly similar look. For the lining of the skirt, I was using a heavier silk charmeuse, which is again pretty similar to what they used. But they also have a few other fabrics throughout the garments, but these were the main two in the skirts. There are some reinforcements, such as a bias strip of cotton sateen, that sit in the back opening to reinforce the area where the hooks and eyes are going to be placed. Most of the edges in this lining are raw edges, which will eventually be folded over and hemmed or done with sort of a top stitched French seam to finish them off. Though the center front seam is cut on the selvage edge and it's left with incredibly wide seam allowance. In fact, all of the seam allowances are left pretty wide and there is evidence of alterations. Clearly the lining was cut off of a pattern that was meant to be adjustable for lots of different sizes. And in fact, I could have adjusted the lining for the skirt by quite a few inches up to four or five inches without having to add any additional seam allowance. I did end up having to adjust the skirt up a few inches in order to fit me better, but I didn't have to add anything to the seam allowance, so that was nice. Once we're done with the actual construction of the lining, it's time to attach it to the waistband. For this, they used a very wide piece of Petersham ribbon. They seem to have used a piece that is too wide, so they actually cut down the top edge and bound it. I found a piece that was about the right width, so I didn't have to deal with doing that. Along the piece of Petersham, they actually have spaced out pieces of feather bone, which seem to be stitched down in two different ways. Pieces that are spaced equally throughout are stitched down by machine, whereas the pieces at the end are stitched down by hand, because they had to be moved in order for the hooks and eyes to be placed in. This implies to me that this was a pre-made piece of waistbanding, with all of the boning already stitched on, and that it was simply cut to be the right height and then cut to be the right length as well. They just simply made some adjustments in order to find the right places for the boning to deal with the fasteners. For the overlays, they're attached in many different ways in very unusual angles all over the skirt lining. They clearly made up the lining to fit and then draped and pleated and pinned and stitched the pieces over the lining in order to get the correct effect. So there are two pieces on the exterior, one on the left and one on the right. The one on the right does overlap the other one, so we are started with the left side first. It's pleated up along the front edge and there are parts of that that use a selvage as well as other sections that use the raw edges. For the raw edges, they finish off those with a piece of tape. When it comes to the selvage edges, they instead just simply top stitch those directly to the lining. Once both sides are pleated up and stitched down to the lining, the very top gets folded up over and gathered up by hand and directly stitched to the top of the waistbanding to cover up the exterior. The back sort of has this overlapping closure and it uses both snaps and hooks and eyes to fasten shut. 
It has quite a bit of reinforcement along those edges, just as the skirt lining did. Instead of the cotton sateen, however, it's bias strips of the silk charmeuse that were used for the lining. All of those edges are then folded over and then bound in a silk ribbon. This is also the point where I start to see more and more hand stitching used, and it will continue to multiply in terms of its usage well into the bodice. One of the more unusual effects of the skirt comes at the center back right below the opening. The second piece that wraps over the right side has a very unusual section of pleats that hits right below the hip line and the center back. It has a piece above it that simply drapes down over them in order to finish it off. Inside, the raw edges are finished with a piece of tape that is hand stitched down, and it's placed directly below the center back opening, which seems a little bit unusual in the fact that it seems to overrun the center back opening, which actually had to be stitched back up by a few inches in order to accommodate where these pleats needed to be, which does actually argue for the fact that parts of this at least were originally made to accommodate quite a few different sizes or shapes whether the lining was made up as a standard piece and the drapery was done custom over it, or the entire piece was meant to be adjustable depending on who they needed to custom fit it to, is questionable. But the lining definitely was not made knowing exactly how the drapery was going to interact with it. There are other amendments all over the skirt and the bodice that show that quite a few alterations were made to this garment during some sort of fitting. Not only are the seam allowances left very wide, and certain thread marks or other thread scarring show that there were minor alterations made all over the garment, in addition to the fact that with the massive seam allowances, they were going to make sure that it was going to fit whoever it needed to fit. When it comes to the bodice, the place that I really had to start first was with the little tucks that were all over. There were these unusual top stitching sections that are done both in the back and front, as well as the skirt and collars that sort of replace the actual side back or front dart seams. It's not that they actually reshape the garment, they just simply add texture and sort of mimic the seam placement. For the straight tucks on the bodice, they reinforce it with a straight strip of muslin, and for the curved tucks like that on the back or on the collar, they reinforce everything with bias strips. They use this muslin throughout the bodice to do reinforcements. It's very lightweight, but it gives a very crisp, clean edge. It's also very inexpensive, and interestingly enough, it looks like it has been reused from previous projects. Not only does it have cuts and nicks throughout in unusual places, but it also has pencil lines drawn on it, so it might have actually been recycled from a previous twirl. The muslin in the front also covers where the dart is in the front piece, which runs from the shoulder down to the bust point and helps to shape over the bust. There's a little bit of gathering at the bottom of the bodice at the front to help shape, but most of it comes from this rather large dart that runs up into the shoulder. Once the bodice shell has been assembled, we move on to the multiple collars and front edge embroidery that needs to be added. The sailor's collar that falls down over the back has yet another little tuck. Instead of using the cotton muslin like the rest of the bodice, however, it's reinforced with the same bias strip of cotton sateen that was used as the reinforcement for the center back and the skirt lining. It seems to be the only place where that particular textile was used in the bodice, but I have a feeling it's because that strip was already cut to the idea which was in much wider pieces. The underside of the collar is faced with that lighter weight silk charmeuse that was used for the lining, most of the silk satin that you see used on the bodice is the heavier, stiffer style. It's used on the high collar, the sash, and the embroidery. But the charmeuse is used in this one case as a sort of lining that won't be seen, as the collar will lay down and actually be tacked into place. Just like the skirt, I found that there were many hidden reinforcements inside of the bodice. Along the front edge of just the front pieces, not around the neck, there is a tailor's tape that is stitched down by way of the machine top stitching that runs along the front edge. For the back neckline, there is instead a bias strip of the same silk charmeuse that was used as the lining. This allows us to get around the neckline curve with the bias, with a piece that has enough reinforcement to help solidify that area, which needs a lot of things attached to it, but it doesn't prevent it from curving and being flexible. It's important to have that area reinforced because we're going to start off by stitching a lot of different things to that neckline. First, we're going to stitch the sailor's collar to the back area of the neckline by way of a running stitch on the interior side. 
It then gets folded down over the neck and tacked down by way of another running stitch through just the lining in order to hold it nice and folded over the top of that neckline. And yes, those white basting stitches to hold the seam allowance do actually stay in there forever. Now the standing collar is made up of two different fabrics. The silk satin, which is the stiffer type, is up against the neck while the silk jacquard is on the exterior of the collar, which is more visible. Interestingly enough, they did the jacquard in four pieces, but the satin in only two. That's because every single seam for the jacquard actually has a little wire stitched in. Each one is whipped into place and it allows the collar to not only hold its vertical shape, but to also give it a nice curve outwards. I found as I put this jacket on for the first time that the collar was so incredibly tall that it sort of jabbed up into the back of my head and into my face, so I had to curve the collar outwards near the top in order to not have that happen. And that makes perfect sense as to why they would choose wire over any sort of other interfacing, because interfacing wouldn't allow you to really put that curve into the collar. It would just keep it straight up outright and very stiff and probably very uncomfortable. The next thing I dealt with was the skirt of the bodice. There's actually a lot of reinforcement in this skirt, despite being very lightweight. They use strips of muslin along all of the edges, which have been folded over for extra support. The bottom uses a bias strip of muslin because it does have a little bit of curve, but the sides have straight strips. There's also, interestingly enough, little weights in the corner. They are similar in weight and shape and size to the washers that you can get from the hardware store. So that's what I ended up using for mine. All of the use of the muslin within this garment is just absolutely essential to make sure nothing stretches or warps. The fabric jacquard is just so lightweight and could easily stretch and warp and become a problem if it doesn't have this reinforcement. But you can't use a heavy interfacing to do this. Such stiff interfacing as any sort of canvas would show through too easily. You'd see all of its hard edges and just wouldn't interact with the jacquard in a way that it needs to in order to make sure that it still looks loose and draped. Mm -hmm. 
complete with the actual structure of the bodice shell, but there's one more piece that has to be added in. There's a little bit of batting at the shoulder area where you tend to get a hollow between the chest and the collarbone. This piece is just two layers thick and is very loosely basted into place, just catching the muslin interfacing inside of the bodice. I tried on my bodice with the one side with and one side without the batting, and found that the side without on the left generally had a lot more wrinkles than the right side, and actually looked a little bit deflated compared to the correct side, which has a more rounded chest that you would expect for that era. Then we can finally get to dealing with the lining. The original lining is pretty much gone, which is one of the reasons why I can tell so much about the construction of this garment. But it was a very lightweight, crisp silk satin. It was ecot woven with flowers throughout. I did manage to find a similar weight and finish of silk, and it does actually have a floral ecot design, though it's a little bit of a different pattern and color. But I still think it's very reflective of the original. The lining itself is simplified slightly in the fact that I didn't use quite as many seams and I just pleated it into the waist. Of course, this is a little bit of conjecture, just because there are only a few tiny scraps of fabric left inside, so I had to make some guesses as to how the lining was fit in based off of what remnants of stitches I could find or what tiny little bits of silk were still left. Next, it's onto the sleeves, which has a similar tucked and embroidered section on the cuff. There's nothing dramatically different in the construction there. The tucked piece has a little bit of muslin on the backing, just like all of the other sections, and everything is machine top stitch before it is assembled completely by hand and is added to the bottom of the sleeves, which are pleated to fit. piece of the puzzle is that of the sash. This is made of that stiff, heavier silk satin, just like we saw on the collar and the embroidery, and it's just two long straight strips. The piece that goes around the waist is gathered up in a very interesting manner, where they fold over the fabric and then gather it up by hand to create a little ridge or tuck. It not only creates a great amount of texture, but it also helps to hold all the gathers into place because the sash is so wide and the fabric is stiff, it just doesn't want to hold gathers nicely. The hanging strip is done separately and it is done in the manner of a tube. The top of which is finished off with a little bit of gathering, then it is folded over to hide the raw edge. The bottom is finished off with a little bit of fringe that has been knotted together. 
The original has a very long silk fringe, but I used a slightly shorter cotton fringe because that was the closest thing I could find to the overall style. I really do hope that at some point I can take the time to make my own fringe, but it just wasn't a possible thing with this project. The top of the hanging piece, where the loop is, is used to cover up the end of the horizontal waist sash, which is then just snapped across and hangs nicely just off-center to the left. Mm -hmm. 